Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session in American English Live Teacher Development Series 6. My name is Lauren, and I'll be with you today, along with my colleague behind the scenes, Abigail, who will be serving as moderator to help answer your questions and respond to your comments during the session. Today, our host, Kate, will be talking with our presenter, Heather Benucci, about digital literacy, uh, along with how and why these skills can be integrated into English language instruction. So let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kate, as Lauren said, and I'm so happy to be with you here today for the first session in Series 6 of American English Live Teacher Development. We're happy to see everyone here. Um, of course, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of our first time viewers and to those of you who we've seen many times before. We're so glad to have you back and we hope you're as excited as we are for this coming series. So let's begin with a look at these photos featuring teachers from around the world as they participated in sessions and discussed webinar topics during series five. We love to see teachers like you in viewing groups. Um, so please share your photos of viewing groups by emailing them to American English webinars at FHI360.org. Please note that this is a new email address, American English webinars at FHI360.org. Um, so make sure to change that in your contacts list if you've already had it. Um, and please, please share your photos with us. We'd love to see them. You can also share them on social media. And if you do so, please tag us at American English for Educators so that we can feature one of your photos during the next series. Today is our first session of American English Live Teacher Development Series 6. We have an exciting lineup for you. Um, we have topics related to digital literacy skills, communicative grammar teaching, and foundations of TESOL methodology. Today we're exploring digital literacy. Which session are you most excited about? Share your responses in the chat or comments. And we hope that throughout this series, you'll be able to get lots of great ideas and useful practical activities um, that you can use in your classrooms. So as a reminder, here's what to expect today. Each session is about 60 minutes long and is often related to an American English eTeacher massive open online course or to a teacher's corner theme on the American English website or social media group. The presenter will present the material and I, as your host, will ask questions and make comments as well. But we really hope to hear from you, our audience, so that we can address your ideas and experiences. So please do share your thoughts and comments in the chat box or the comments feature. When our series comes to a close in about an hour, you will have an opportunity to receive a digital badge for your participation. At the end of the session, we'll share a link in the comments and at the top of this post. Click on that link and complete a short quiz about today's session. The quiz will have one page where it will request information about you, your name, your email address, etc. Make sure to fill that out carefully. And then the second page will have a quiz. So you have to answer two out of three multiple choice questions correctly. Once you've successfully passed that quiz, you should expect to receive your badge via email within about a week. So make sure to check your spam folders um, and the email should be coming from badger at badger.io. So make sure you're looking out for that. And it's not too late to join the free professional development online course self-paced massive open online course, integrating critical thinking skills into the exploration of culture in an English as a foreign language setting. This free self-paced course is offered between July 8th, so it started a little while ago, and um, September 30th. So you have to register though by September 20th to make sure you have time to complete all of the activities. All coursework needs to be done by the, 20, the 30th in order to pass. You can find more information at the link listed here on the page. And now for today's session, Digital Literacies, Practical Approaches for the ELT Classroom. This session aims to clarify the multi-skill digital, digital literacies construct and explores how and why these skills can be integrated into English language instruction. 
This presentation will explore models for thinking about digital literacies, examine benefits and challenges associated with systematically addressing a selection of digital literacies in ELT settings, and review adaptable activities designed to help English language learners like your students develop the 21st century skills that will serve them in the classroom and beyond. And now we are pleased to introduce our presenter for today, Heather Benucci. And you may recognize Heather Benucci as one of our moderators as well. So Heather is an English as a foreign language teacher, educator, and materials development specialist who has led virtual professional development programs for teachers from over 100 countries. She has been a US Department of State English language specialist for projects in Russia and Brazil. And she's also worked with teachers and students in South Korea, England, and the United States. Heather holds a master's degree in TESOL and a master's degree in international relations with an emphasis on intercultural communication. She serves as co-chair elect of TESOL International's, TESOL International Association's Computer Assisted Language Learning Interest Section and is a contributing editor for English Teaching Forum. So we're really lucky to have Heather presenting with us today. Thank you so much for being here, Heather. Welcome. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Kate. I'm happy as always to be here with you teachers from around the world. And I'm particularly excited today to kick off AE Live webinar series six. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, as we begin our discussion of digital literacies, we're going to start out with an attitude survey, an opinion survey. So I'm going to ask, uh, make three statements here and just make note if you agree or disagree with each and we'll revisit these uh, statements towards the end of our session today. So number one, being digitally literate is knowing how to operate a computer, tablet, smartphone, or internet connected advice. What do you think? Just sort of make a note to yourself, agree or disagree. Okay, number two. My students know how to use digital tools much better than me, so there isn't much for me to teach them. What do you think about that one? Agree or disagree? And finally, number three, my syllabus is already full with everything I need to teach related to language. I don't have time to teach digital literacy skills as well. Agree or disagree? Okay, just some things to think about with your uh, existing opinions before we dive into our agenda for the day. Um, so what we will cover, as Kate had mentioned, uh, we are going to work through two models of um, thinking about digital literacies. And then we're going to examine how, why we should use them in the classroom, uh, as well as some challenges to potentially including these topics in our classes. And then we'll look at how to program them into our syllabus. And we'll also look at some specific adaptable activities that involve different levels of technology. And before we move into the content, uh, I did want to say um, that today we are not going to talk about specific applications or programs or pieces of hardware. We're going to talk um, big picture, general concepts related to the idea of what it means to be digitally literate. Um, so not really how to use tech tools individually. And then second, I do want to recognize, um, and especially based on the great responses we got to the Facebook discussion earlier this week on the American English for Educators page, um, that everybody's classroom is different around the world and not everyone has equal access to technology in the classroom, whether that's uh, an internet connection, uh, computers, or if your students are or aren't allowed to bring mobile devices into the classroom. Um, so don't let some limits to um, technology access stop you from thinking about the concepts we're going to cover today. We'll look at ways to adapt. Um, and even if some of these options aren't possible for you right now, um, maybe they will be in the future. Um, or if you can think about it as just a good general information to know about things that are being discussed in our field of language teaching. All right, so with that, Let's start out with a question for you. Um, please share your ideas with us of what does it mean to be literate? All right, everybody, we'd like to hear from you. What are your thoughts about this word literate? How would you define the word literate? Um, what, what does it mean to you in your words? Let's see. I see Salma says awareness. 
Interesting. Great thought. Um, let's see. You're seeing a lot of responses related to um, reading and writing, being able to read and write. Great. What other ideas do you have about the term literate? What does it mean to you? Let's see. Ad Adnan says literate means being able to read. Um, let's see. To know, understand, um, and to practically implement information. Wonderful. Mari Kaur says knowing something. Raf Raif says uh, to know how to use something. Um, to be able to read and write to attain a higher goal from Monica. Great mm -hmm. responses, everybody. Uh, super ideas, everyone. Um, I did notice the theme that focused on reading and writing, and I would say that that has been a traditional sort of a measurement um, related to literacy. But let's look at a 2018 definition um, from the International Literacy Association. And they say that literacy is the ability to understand, interpret, create, compute, and communicate using visual, audible, and digital materials across disciplines and in a variety of contexts. So you'll see there is that text element, the reading and writing that many of you mentioned, but also this, this idea now of multimedia literacy, visual, audio, and digital materials. Um, and also um, the Oxford Dictionary is mentioned as um, general competency within a specific area. So given that information, let's ask another question. What does it mean to be digitally literate? What skills might be involved there? All right, great question. So we talked about the definition of literate. Now let's move into digitally literate. Um, how would you define that and what skills would you include in being digitally literate? Let's see, Soza says going beyond the limits. Nice, <laughs> I love it. Um, decoding from Mari Ter. Wonderful, let's see. Um, what other things do you think everybody? What does it mean to be digitally literate and what skills might be involved? To know how to use tech for learning. I love that um, response from Kudra Tula. To think outside of the box from Hina. And Lizzie says to be able to communicate and process and evaluate information using the internet. Wonderful responses. I think um, we're on to something, Heather. What do you think? <laughs> I love those answers. Um, a good variety, and you all are showing some uh, critical thinking there, I see, by expanding your definition for digital literacy um, beyond just computer use. So let's look at two models and see if they help us understand this complex topic just a bit more. Our first model is from Doug Belshaw, uh, who is an uh, educator in the realm of educational technology. And he has defined eight elements of digital literacies. And you'll notice he, he emphasizes the plural, that it's not just one skill set. And he, um, everything conveniently starts with a C here in his model. So let's start on the upper left-hand side. And he claims the cultural set, um, these uh, attitudes and skills related to cultural knowledge are actually some of the most uh, important in terms of digital literacies. And this is, understanding how to behave and interact in different digital settings. So maybe um, in online uh, chat situations or using social media or how you are interacting um, in a social sense online. And he kind of ties that in with also um, cognitive abilities, the next item there, which is understanding how digital space is organized and being able to take that information and move it across different media. So maybe an example is knowing how a menu works um, for something on your phone, and then being able to translate that knowledge into using a menu in another digital setting. Um, constructive, uh, that element has to do with being able to build, to build upon the work of others, um, and to do it responsibly. That means giving credit to those uh, or whose work you are using, um, respecting copyright, things such as that. And then on the language side for us, communicative. Um, not just interacting necessarily socially, which is important, um, but for a variety of purposes. So it might be educational or professional. And then moving on to that bottom row, starting on the left, uh, is confident. And I really like this one. It is having an attitude about how you solve problems and manage your own learning and being willing um, to accept that um, 
that we don't know everything and being an information seeker, trying to fill gaps in our own learning. And then uh, creative has to do with making things and adding value uh, based on um, expression um, and creating uh, new materials. Uh, critical is something that many of you just mentioned, which I liked a lot. Um, this idea of evaluating and analyzing um, information, where it comes from, biases that might be involved, um, and using our critical thinking skills. And lastly, he talks about the civic element of digital literacy, which is um, kind of taking some of these other elements and using them to do, to participate in communities, to take action on issues that are important to us. Um, so as you can see, um, Kate, I know I was surprised um, when I started really thinking about this topic, that it's not just about um, knowing how to use a device or a specific tool, but there's a lot of social um, and cultural information um, and skills that are, are, are really important in these models as well. Absolutely, and I really like um, how these are all brought up in this model, because um, I think those are really important skills for our students um, when they're using technology or when they're not using technology. Definitely. Okay, so this is our first model, and let's take a look at a second um, that was created by three authors, um, Gavin Dudley, Nikki Hockley, and Mark Pegram, and they work in the field of language education in our field. And they took this plural concept of digital literacies and divided it up into four categories of subliteracies or sub skills, language, information, connections, and redesign. So let's take a closer look at each of these. First off, language. Um, they've defined six sub skills within this. Um, the first of which is text literacy, that traditional idea of literacy to some extent, but also knowing how to use text language or SMS language, abbreviated language that might be used in social media, knowing when that's appropriate, knowing when it's not. Also, uh, hypertext literacy. This is the ability to understand what a link is, how to use it, maybe how to create it, how to shorten it, and to think about how these links affect us as readers. Um, maybe we get diverted from our original reading by following links. I know that happens to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes when there's no links within a digital document, um, you get a little bit frustrated because uh, it would be convenient for that information to be right there for you. Um, with multimedia literacy skills, that's the ability to uh, use, interpret, and create information um, beyond just text. So maybe adding in digital images, audio, and video. And then our next set here underneath the language category include um, mobile literacy, which is more than just using our phones to find information or to make a call. Um, it might be interacting with the world around us. So many of you might have seen these QR, quick response codes around the black and white pattern that you see there um, as a way to use our phone to scan a physical object, maybe at a museum or a tourist site, and then um, receive additional information that way. Um, and there's also opportunities to interact um, with digital overlays using our phones onto the real world around us. This is called augmented reality. So lots of new and exciting things that we can do with our mobile phones. Um, and the final two um, might come into play more or less in class, depending on where you're teaching and what you're teaching. But gaming literacy is the idea of being able to communicate within a gaming world to solve problems with games uh, and to reach objectives. Uh, and with code literacy, this is the language that computers use. Um, it might be less of an issue for us language teachers unless we're working in an ESP setting, specific purposes setting, maybe related to science, technology, engineering, or math. Great. We have a nice comment from Marwa who says um, that she sees that these skills are sort of divided into two classes, one professional and the other personal. And I think that's true, Marwa, but the exciting thing about digital literacy is it kind of overlaps between both. So oftentimes things with digital literacy that we're using in our personal lives sort of um, transpose over to our professional lives as well. But thanks for that, for that comment, Marwa. Exactly, Kate. And something we as teachers can do is kind of empower our learners to be able to make those choices to say, I want to use this communication tool for a professional purpose, or I might change my language because I'm using it for a social or fun purpose. 
All right, let's move on to our next focus here, which is information. Um, the four sub skills these authors have identified are tagging literacy, which is understanding how information is cataloged on the internet, uh, search literacy and filtering literacy, which are very, very closely connected. Um, search literacy is moving beyond using maybe that one main search engine that might be popular where you live um, and helping our students understand that there are specialty search engines for finding particular types of information. Uh, maybe you're for searching for images or searching for video content or language learning content, that there is more than one way to conduct an internet search. And then with filtering, that is the ability to kind of take down, we get so many um, bits of information, whether it's through a search or just in our daily lives, being able to find the information that's relevant for us and for our needs, and also being able to kind of shut out information overload, which is definitely a challenge most of us face on a daily basis. And the last sub-skill in this information focus area is information literacy. And this overlaps with Doug Belshaw's critical element. Um, that's the critical thinking about where our information comes from. Uh, you might have also heard the term media literacy. Um, that has a big overlap with this category as well. All right, so let's keep moving. Uh, on to connections. So Kate, a question for you. What kind of things do you think are associated with this connections focus area? Yeah, I think I, I think about um, maybe my social media, um, maybe my professional and personal um, communities of practice that are online. Um, yeah, it's, I feel like it's kind of about people on this one. Is that right? Exactly. This is all about people, connections. Um, so with personal literacy, that is how we portray ourselves online, how we choose to portray ourselves online often. Um, so that could be things about uh, managing profiles, um, privacy settings, security settings, so taking care of our personal um, portrayal online. With network literacy, um, those are the people you learn with. Right now we're in the middle of a personal learning network, a professional learning network. Here interacting with teachers around the world, um, you probably are a member of several networks. Um, so this can be where you get your news, where you get your professional development, where you have your uh, social interactions. So understanding how those, those pieces come together to help you um, be informed in different categories of life. And with participatory literacy, um, this has some overlap with the, the cultural category from Doug Belshaw, but it's knowing how to behave in different media spaces and whether you're using them for professional purposes or social purposes or educational purposes. You might see the word netiquette there, which is a blend of net and etiquette. So the rules of behavior for um, interacting online. And last, but certainly not least from our perspective, is intercultural literacy. So online, um, whether or not it is in a single class or um, out there with the world, with the digital connections, you have the ability not just to interact with people from other countries, which you certainly do, but um, people with different interest groups, so different subcultures, uh, different generational cultures, um, a variety of types of cultural groups. Um, so understanding how to do that in a constructive uh, way uh, is what is involved with intercultural literacy. All right, and our last focus area in this model um, is considered to be the most complex skill, which is remix literacy, which falls under the redesign focus area. And this has to do with uh, Belshaw's constructive element, this idea of building on the work of others and also um, creativity for your own purposes to con convey or share your own messages. So two examples of this might be um, the ability to understand or to create memes, which is this idea of kind of adding a caption or a subtitle to an image from popular culture, maybe a movie or something that's happening in news or politics and kind of to make a different point. So this can involve skills like understanding humor or sarcasm and all of those things can be quite important for language learners. Um, another classroom example related to remix literacy is uh, digital storytelling, digital story making, um, using a variety of media, audio, pictures um, to tell a video based story um, of personal significance. Okay, so when you bring all these pieces together, it looks like this. Um, mm -hmm. A variety of sub-literacies under these four key focus areas. Um, 
And a question might come to mind, do we need to teach all of these at once? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> um, as with anything in the classroom, you are going to kind of pick and choose the bits that make sense for your students' needs and learning goals and for your classroom objectives. And we'll look at some ways to get together of, of bringing in certain elements across different language learning activities. Great. Let's see, we have some really nice comments. Just wanted to bring up a couple of them here. So let's see, Ulysses from Mexico. That's, thank you for commenting. Hello, Ulysses. He says, this webinar is very interesting because including digital literacy will help us to get our students more engaged in classes. Let's see. Um, another one. This webinar is helping me to improve my classes and motivate my students to learn from Nelita. So thanks for your comments, everyone. And we will um, continue on with lots of other ideas that you can also use in your classroom. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thanks for sharing, everyone. Um, so before we move into the classroom setting, let's just sum up what we've learned, because those two models contain a lot of information. So overall, I hope that you take away that there is not one easy definition for digital literacies, um, that it's fairly complex set of skills and attitudes or mindsets um, about technology and its role in our lives. So everything from technological, how to use the tools, communicative, how to achieve a purpose um, by sharing information or receiving information, moving ideas and information across cultures, and also that creativity, that constructive aspect of um, digital engagement. Okay. And um, I do want to say, uh, sadly, at the end of the day, there is no one certificate that get, you get that says you are digitally literate forever. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Becoming digitally literate is a lifelong learning process because technologies change constantly and we have to adapt um, what we teach and what our students are interested in learning and knowing um, based on that. And um, Doug Belshaw makes this really important point that you can be an expert in one aspect of digital literacies and a novice or a new person to another area. And that is okay. Um, it's being willing to take a look at those areas where we might be novices and going, this is something I want to learn more about. And finally, um, it's not just knowing how to turn on that computer or turn on that tablet or send a text message to your friend. Um, it's thinking about how these technologies and the information associated with them affect our daily lives and our societies and also helping our students um, kind of move beyond just social uses of technology and thinking about how to use them appropriately to achieve different goals, whether they're personal, professional, or educational. Sounds All right. Good. Mm -hmm. So whew, we made <laughs> section one, looking at those complex models of digital literacies. Now let's turn towards the classroom and think about why we might want to bring these skill sets into our EFL classes. So that's my next question for you all. Why incorporate digital literacy skills in class? What might be some of the benefits? Great question. Let's see everybody, what do you think? Why should we incorporate these skills into our classroom? What are the benefits of incorporating digital literacy skills in the English as a foreign language classroom? Um, I like how Ulysses in Mexico earlier shared some great ideas. But let's see, from AIR, greater awareness when learning, excellent. Um, globalization, nice, maybe a glo globalization skills for our students. Uh, it makes your classroom more interactive from Ronnie. Let's see, Karen says, because we are in a changing world, nice. Um, let's see, what else? It enhances the attention of the student from Salma, very nice, so maybe it, digital literacy or incorporating some of these um, skills and topics might help engage or motivate students. Um, it helps to challenge our students. And Ramona says students can be creative and um, that's definitely part of it, wonderful. And yeah, developing communicative competence from Edith. So wonderful ideas, everybody. Thanks so much for sharing. Indeed, thank you for those ideas. Um, excellent across the board. Uh, let's look at a couple of um, reasons I have compiled here for us to think about. 
Um, so with increased digital literacy skills, our learners can interact with English language online content. Um, and what that means is, especially for certain educational settings and certain professional settings, a lot of the digital publishing that's related to perhaps uh, medicine, engineering fields such as that, is going to be mostly available in English language. So um, helping our students navigate that environment really can provide greater access to information. Um, and that applies to some uh, social and news information as well. And my favorite reason is, um, it allows our students to write and um, speak and communicate for audiences beyond us, beyond the teachers. So even if you are practicing some of these skills in a safe classroom environment, they're writing for the audience of other classmates. And maybe if you're doing something um, that's more outwardly directed, they could be writing for a real audience in their community or beyond. Um, so it gives students some motivation that they're not just communicating in an artificial way, that real authentic need to communicate. Um, it also opens up connections um, among all types of English users. And by that, I mean it gives students chances to interact with other non-native speakers as well as native speakers around the world, which is a pretty amazing opportunity. Um, and lastly here is it allows students to represent themselves in English. So creating that, using that personal um, digital literacy skill to represent themselves through um, how they create their profiles, the information they share, um, the products they create. Okay, and a few more are um, building on existing skills. Um, as many of you um, I'm sure have experienced, our students uh, often have great um, abilities and capabilities related to using technology for social purposes. And here we're helping them be perhaps more thoughtful about how they're using technology how their choices affect their um, personal or career um, prospects. And we'll look at an activity related to that in just a bit. And it also helps build uh, 21st century skills. Can you give me an example of a 21st century skill, Kate? Hmm, I would say maybe collaboration or problem solving. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, information management, um, all of these skills are what um, educators and um, perhaps future bosses uh, are looking for in our learners today. And last, but definitely not least, as many of you mentioned in our discussion question there, increased motivation, um, achieving goals, and uh, as I said, that real communication need that can be uh, done in the digital world um, can be very relevant and motivating to our students. Great. We have a couple of quick comments, let's see, from Central Venezolano Americano. I think that's the Binational Center in Venezuela. We're so happy to have you here. Um, it's nice to learn about procedures and norms to communicate and interact in social networks, very nice. And Marlena says literacy skills can help to develop our intercultural competence. Students will be able to understand other points of view and develop their critical thinking. Wow. Really well said. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> Indeed. All right. So those are a lot of positive things. Now let's think about some of the tricky aspects. So my next question for you all is what are some of the challenges to bringing these digital literacy skills into the language classroom? Great question. All right. So we talked a lot about all the benefits and the positive side of things, but we have to make sure to address those challenges as well. So what do you think, everybody? What are some challenges to focusing on digital literacies in your classroom? What do you think? Um, what are some tricky aspects, which means um, some difficult or some, some issues, some possible, some possible issues? Um, let's see, what do you think? Um, maybe there are not very many tech tools in your context, very good point. Uh, low tech access, says Carol. Let's see. Um, infrastructure, maybe administrative, administratively, there's not a lot of support at your schools for this type of thing. Um, physical support or even just the support, um, the verbal support or the policy support that you need. There's a high cost for some, of, for, for some tech tools. Good point. Um, maybe the students' expectations are very high with all of the technology that is out there. Um, very good. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Excellent ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. 
Excellent points there. Um, and I did notice somebody too also mentioned uh, cultural considerations, uh, Salma Naz did, um, which I think is valid. Um, not every um, tech tool or uh, every type of content might be appropriate in every section, every location uh, due to certain cultural considerations. And it's our job obviously as the teachers to be aware of what makes good sense for our classroom. All right, we will circle back to addressing some of these challenges as we look at how to plan for them and uh, incorporating them into our syllabus, which is our next topic. All right, moving on. Okay, so we are going to talk about preparation and planning, two things that we should all be experts at and as teachers, something that we exercise uh, every day as we get ready for our classes. Um, but we'll look at this um, from a slightly different angle today. Uh, so Kate, at the start of a new class, um, have you ever done a survey or a discussion activity or maybe a writing activity with your students to learn a bit more about um, their goals and their interests? Yeah, definitely. I love to start off a new class by getting to know my students to find out what their interests are and to find out what they want to get out of the class. Definitely. Exactly. That helps us sort of program some of our content to make sure we're meeting their needs and having them be motivated about what we include. Um, from a digital literacies perspective, we also need to take an inventory of our access to technology. So that's as a teacher understanding the access in the classroom and perhaps also asking our students what their access is like outside of class. Maybe all of your students have regular internet um, access at home or they have good access through an American space or a local library. Um, that's good information to know as you design activities. And we can also ask our students and ourselves about our own knowledge of digital literacy uh, elements or skills as we've covered in those two models. So you might use a skills inventory that looks like this. This is just a short sample of a skills inventory um, from Dudney, Hockley, and Pegram. Um, I'll share that full um, inventory list with you that you can adapt via the Ning resource page. Um, but you might ask your students, and you can adapt this according to their language level, or if you're teaching very, very beginners, you might consider offering it in the first language if that's a possibility where you are. But you can ask them about things like, I can recognize when it's appropriate to use mobile devices in class. Or maybe I can use a variety of search engines for different types of searches. So maybe beyond that one big search engine where you are. Um, you may also ask them about some of those social interpersonal connections types of literacies, such as knowing how to deal with difficult situations or difficult people they might encounter online. And you can even ask them about that complex skill of remix. Um, do they know how to combine and edit um, existing digital content to make something new? Um, so this is just a little bit of a way you can have more insight, more knowledge about what your students already know and what they might need to work on. And from there, with that information about access and pre-existing skills, you need to think about the why. Why do you want to bring a certain type of technology or a certain technology topic into the classroom? Um, we always say um, in the uh, technology education sphere, no technology for technology's sake. And that means um, you don't just grab a shiny tool or a shiny new app and bring it into the classroom because it's cool or exciting, you need to know what you want to do with it. So for each type of tool or skill set focus, think about are you trying to make something easier, more efficient? Are you trying to provide language input to your students, maybe through a podcast or a TED talk? Um, are you trying to promote students communicating with each other, solving problems, creating something new, or maybe just in general building their digital literacy skills? And from there, we can look at how to program this information into our syllabus. So what you see here is a fairly typical week um, and a um, topic oriented type syllabus about around my town or sightseeing in my town. You might have some simple present uh, language items to work on, tourism vocabulary and um, descriptions for places. And you might have two textbook um, text, a listening text an audio track maybe about a museum, and a textbook reading maybe visiting a certain city like Washington, D.C. And at the end of all of this, your students might write a paragraph for tourists who are coming to visit their city. Have you ever taught a, a unit like this, Kate? Yeah, definitely. It's always nice to use things right in students' context to talk about some vocabulary that they're going to need, like being around their town. 
or in their community. Exactly. So how can we take, um, put a digital literacy spin or a digital literacy perspective on this type of unit? So let's um, move on to the next item here. We might substitute different types of text. So that third column from the right, maybe instead of the textbook article on um, Washington, D.C., you might have your students read an online travel blog entry um, on Washington, D.C., or maybe for the audio text, instead of um, the recording that comes with the book, maybe they listen to a podcast inside the Smithsonian in this example. Um, so chances for them to interact with digital content. Um, and as part of that um, travel blog reading, maybe you also do a specific exercise with your students on hyperlinks. How did the author of the travel blog use um, hyperlinks? Where did, how many did they include? What did they link to? Were they helpful? Were they distracting? And then with that information in hand, students either individually or in groups can write their own travel blog entry or travel blog article. And maybe they include images and think about how they would use links about a site in their city. Um, and this can all be done offline as well. The teacher can provide hard copy examples of a travel blog entry, and then the students could do their, um, their writing uh, with pen and paper, and then perhaps um, enter it digitally later if that was an option. Um, but just by changing the text and adding in that hyperlink evaluation exercise, uh, you're bringing in um, several different types of digital literacy skills in, within a fairly traditional unit. Wonderful. Yeah, I love um, how we are seeing right here how we can incorporate some of these digital literacies right into our curriculum. So thanks for sharing this, Heather. Definitely. All right. So from there, let's revisit this idea now that we talked about one specific way to uh, plug some of these skills into your uh, curriculum. We mentioned several um, challenges for digital literacy skills teaching, um, one of which was limited access. So what ideas do you all have? Let's get your creative juices flowing. Um, how might you teach these skills if you have limited access to technology in your classrooms? Great question. Yeah, we've had a couple of comments like Monica says uh, that they can't use cell phones in the classroom or Karima says some teachers don't have experience using the internet. Um, so those are a couple challenges that I've noticed in the comments, but um, what, how can we overcome some of those challenges? I noticed one challenge about a lack of electricity sometimes. So what are some things that we can do to overcome the challenges that we often have with technology? Carol says, download first. I love that one. Yeah, definitely. Download the materials before you're going to use them so you have the hard copy or an, um, a copy on your hard drive or flash drive. Work offline, similar idea from Sophia. Um, learn by accessing webinars like this one from Hazrat. Thanks for that comment. Um, let's see, use recorded materials, very nice. What other options do you have for overcoming limited access to technology? Let's see, Julio says, allowing cell phones in class, but keeping control or helping students to be focused on the right uh, topic or task. Share something before class, like share a PowerPoint or something like that before class. Train teachers to access technology. Very nice, from Saba. Uh, take a laptop with you, from Nahir. Wonderful ideas, everybody. Thanks for sharing. Exactly. Um, I agree, a, a lot of creative ways for working around the challenges that many of us face in the classroom. Let's look at four different options um, that overlap with the comments that many of you made just now. Um, one idea is if you are in a situation where maybe there's only one network computer, maybe the teacher's computer, and perhaps a projector, um, the teacher can do demonstrations of the digital content, such as um, if there was a travel blog entry you were looking at, maybe that could be displayed for the class, um, and you could work through a hyperlink exercise um, together. And then the students could work in groups to prepare their content offline, so using hard copy materials. And then maybe if you do want to capture that and give the students the um, opportunity to build the digital product, um, students can rotate onto that one networked computer and use it as a learning station so uh, the different groups could come together, for example, and create their um, travel blog entries. Um, another situation that's quite common is zero access to the internet or computers in the classroom. 
Um, and in that case, as many of you said, a hard copy example, so you could print that travel um, blog article out, share it with students. Um, maybe they could do their work in class to draft or to plan. And then maybe if possible, if, if your students have good out of class access, which way you would know back in that preparation stage, um, maybe they could do the creation um, for online materials outside of class, that kind of more of a flipped instruction approach. Okay, and as many of you mentioned, um, often students have mobile devices, you might have some institutional um, rules about not bringing them to class, but if you are allowed to use them, um, you can have students BYOD, it's called bring your own device, and students can work in teams or use their own individual devices. Um, as Julio said, it's very helpful to um, establish guidelines together with your students about using these devices appropriately. Maybe devices stay put away except for when you're working on these kinds of activities together to avoid distractions. And the fourth option um, is if you are in a very limited access situation is to use technology as the language content topic. And we're going to look at some examples of that next. Great, um, I just wanted to quickly say we had a nice comment from Marlena who says you could also create a group in WhatsApp and share links so students can access the sources um, that way. So maybe WhatsApp or a similar application where um, it, there is um, uh, low bandwidth but easy messaging, um, you could maybe do something like that. So great suggestion, Marlena. Exactly, and I see a similar idea from uh, Salma as well, so thank you for that. All right, we're into the last section here of our learning path today, and that is taking a look at three different types of activities. And these activities are going to range from sort of lower tech um, to more high tech, but all of them will have an option to do offline as well. So our first activity is called mini debates. Um, and this is related to an English teaching forum article I wrote a couple of years ago um, that asks students to uh, prepare for debates in a slightly different way than many of you might have done before. Um, so for this activity, the class would be given a list of debate topics by the teacher and the class would vote on two topics. Then two groups would form within the class and each group would prepare for their individual debate. So as they prepare, maybe they're brainstorming examples of evidence for or against depending on which team that they're on. And then to practice for these debates, um, or this can be the core of the activity, the main part of the activity, um, they will work in debate lines. And this is what the debate lines look like. Um, so the students in one group on the four team would line up against a um, across from a student on the against side of the debate. And they would have a set amount of time, usually about a minute, to run through their arguments against each other um, so that everyone is actively speaking at the same time during that minute. And when the minute is up, students will prepare to move on the against team. So the person at the end of the against line will move around to the top of the line and everyone else on the against team will take one step over and the students will have the chance to run through the debate again. And maybe they change their argument this time based on the conversation and practice they had in the last round. So unlike a traditional debate, a panel debate, um, where only one or two people have the chance to speak. Um, this is getting all the students talking um, frequently and encountering different types of arguments as they practice. And as you can see with this, not a lot of materials required. Teachers need a timing device, maybe a board and um, some pens or chalk to share that list of topics. And then the students might need something to write with as they prepare their ideas for the debate. And in terms of the language focus, um, practicing a variety of language skills, and then really looking at agreeing and disagreeing and using evidence, um, also showing contrast. So within this activity in English Teaching Forum, there's a chart you can share with students that helps them um, have some set phrases for doing these different types of language functions. And you might be saying, all right, Heather, this sounds like a communicative activity, um, but where's the technology coming in? And this is where we look at the technology as topic option. So for these debate topic sets, you might provide one of the lists from the article about digital communication and social media. And perhaps the students vote on um, the two topics that are highlighted. Um, the benefit of easily sharing information via social media outweighs potential privacy concerns. Or maybe 
Um, our reliance on texting has damaged our ability to have important face-to-face -face conversations. So maybe saying you're sorry and saying thank you. Maybe we don't do those face-to-face -face anymore. And that's the types of topics the groups would prepare to debate. Or maybe you're interested, your students are interested in using uh, video games. So maybe they vote on two topics here, such as people learn to solve real world problems by playing video games. Or playing video games causes people to be sort of antisocial, um, not interacting well with other people. So the students will prepare and do the debate lines for these types of topics. So uh, questions for you, Kate. Do you think that these types of topics would be relevant to students? Would they generate meaningful debate, um, authentic language use? And would, at the same time, they be developing some of their digital literacy skills? Yeah, I definitely think so. And I see um, some nice comments coming in from our audience, too. I think, let's see, um, Tausif says that he's used this strategy in class. That's great. Now here says, I like that in the debate, the learners can switch their position. Um, that way they can understand other points of view. Nice comment. Um, and Majabin thinks that this would really motivate students. So, and, uh, and yes, agrees that they would develop or generate meaningful debate. So definitely. And I think it's really nice to think about um, technology as a topic because I think sometimes when we think about technology, we think, okay, I have to have internet, I have to have a computer. But even just incorporating the topic of technology is really useful because our students are dealing with technology every day in their own lives, even outside of the classroom. So just talking about it and getting them to start developing some of those critical thinking skills through a debate like this is one way to bring their life into the classroom. So I think this is great. Excellent, really well said, Kate. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at some of the sub skills associated with this activity. So for the two topics I showed um, in the example, um, students might be working on their text literacy and mobile literacy on that topic about social community, com excuse me, social media and mobile communications. If you use the video game topic, maybe you're building some gaming literacy concepts. And also a lot of those personal, those connections types of literacy, um, how you participate in online communities and what's um, culturally acceptable in different ways of using technology. All right, let's move on to activity two. Sounds good. All right, and I bet a lot of you out there in your local newspaper, maybe your national newspaper, have an advice column where readers write in and the advice giver provides answers or suggestions for how to solve different problems. And you might have even done advice column type activities in class. Um, and those would, of course, involve things like reading, writing, grammar, vocabulary. And if students are discussing these ideas in uh, groups, maybe they're doing some listening and speaking too. And in terms of the language content you're practicing, depending on your student's level, maybe you're doing uh, more simple imperatives, um, ask, don't, do, um, or maybe you're doing more complex modals and conditionals like uh, you shouldn't, or if I were you, I wouldn't. Um, and so let's look at how we might bring technology as the topic into this type of activity. Maybe the teacher or even better, the students could create the problem prompts and have them um, focused on technology related issues like cyberbullying. And those are situations where unfortunately people use technology tools to kind of bring other people down, maybe by spreading gossip or rumors or saying unkind things. But a lot of our students have faced um, that type of issue. Um, maybe how technology affects or technology addiction affects uh, our relationships or maybe dealing with information overload. And I bet you or your students have a lot of other ideas about specific technology problems that could be created for this type of activity. So you can do that all on um, paper and hard copy and more of the traditional style with technology as the topic, or if you wanna add a technology use um, component to this activity, maybe your school or organization has um, a learning management system or an option to access a digital discussion board like what we have on the name. And you could do this kind of advice column in a threaded discussion like you see here. And students can comment on each other's suggestions for the advice. Uh, you could also use a free blog platform or you could have students record their voices asking the questions and then other people could do voice or video responses 
um, if you want to bring more of a speaking element into this type of activity. And as I said, um, the groups can comment on um, what they think of others' advice throughout this type of activity. So um, everything from a no tech kind of pencil and paper option to more of a tech oriented approach to using this technology as the topic activity. I love it. And a lot of people are, are saying that they love it too in the comments. A lot of people really like this idea. Great. Well, let's see if we can um, have a positive response to this last activity, <laughs> which is about me uh, 2.0. And this is an activity adapted also from the work of Dudney, Hockley, and Pegram. Um, their version is called Online Me. And Kate, have you ever done an activity sort of like the poster that you see here where students share information about their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes, family, things like that? Yeah, I love doing this kind of activity at the beginning of the year and then putting everyone's posters up around my classroom. But I don't think I've ever done the About Me 2.0, so I'm excited to learn more about that. Right, yeah, it's a great way to learn about our students and to build some class community. So with this activity, we start out by uh, the teacher would create a, if we can move to the next, perfect, um, create an example about me poster. So I've got one here um, and it contains mostly professional type information I would share with this audience. Um, but you could, after showing an example, ask students to think about what they would want to include in their digital posters. And after they've done that brainstorming, you're going to ask them to stop and think about audiences online and ask them if their poster were available to the whole world online, would it change what content they put in it? Oh, that will probably. <laughs> and you can help them think even more deeply about this by giving them this graphic organizer. They would fill out this grid and thinking about different audiences. You can see on the left, everything from people you're close to, like your family and your friends, to maybe um, close but still distant, like your English language classmates. Um, to a school admissions officer, your future employer, or the whole wide world, and ask them to list what types of information they would include, maybe what photos they would include, or what types of video or audio links they might include. This really helps them get a clear sense of this idea of online audiences. And after they would fill that out, they would discuss with a partner, and then they would move on to building their poster. And for this section, they would first identify which of those audiences they wanted to create a poster for, and then they would build it. So there's three pieces to this puzzle. Um, first, they need to have their ideas and the text or the media that they want to include in their poster, and that can be done with your help and scaffolding um, with a template, or maybe you want to provide them a graphic organizer, kind of like that poster in the picture that we saw. And then they'll need um, to find images or other multimedia content to use in their poster, um, and I've included a few examples of some open source, some no copyright um, type of image uh, search sites that you can use. And then last but not least, you'll need to have a creation tool. And so, as I said, you can do this with paper markers um, on the lower tech end of things, or you can use a program like PowerPoint or an open source design program like Canva or Globster EDU, and you would have to do some support with getting students comfortable with those platforms. Um, but those are sort of the three pieces needed for creating their poster. And then after the posters are built, you would digitally share them or display them somehow. And then students can give each other feedback about whether or not their content that they included is appropriate for the uh, audience that they selected. And this activity really lends itself nicely to discussions and thinking about creating your online profile. How do you create that online me? What are you sharing with the world? Um, via your posts, via your online profiles, how do you manage your privacy and security settings. Um, so a language oriented way to talk about these complex digital literacy topics. All right, so what skills are involved here? Let's take a look. Um, everything from on the language side, text to multimedia literacy. You might need search literacy for finding your multimedia content. Um, you could even consider this an example of remix as you're bringing in other pieces of content from lo um, other locations to create an original piece. And all of those personal type connections oriented literacies related to how we interact and portray ourselves online. All right, well, with that, 
We have reached the end of our learning path together about digital literacies. We've looked at what they are, um, some benefits and challenges of using them in the classroom, and how to plug them into our syllabus, as well as some adaptable activities. And before we close today, I'd like to go back to our very beginning agree or disagree survey. Um, maybe you've confirmed some of your opinions. Maybe your opinions have changed over the course of our time together today. Um, you know, now do you agree or disagree that digital literacy is limited to knowing how to operate a computer or device? Um, maybe you've changed your opinion about students knowing much more than you about how to use digital tools appropriately. And maybe you've seen that it's not as tricky as you might first think to bring some of these skills and program them into your existing curriculum, even if you have a set curriculum you have to teach. So I thank you all for sharing your experiences, your classroom ideas, um, inner creativity uh, with me and with your colleagues around the world today. Uh, it's been great learning with you um, and thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Heather, for that great session and for guiding us through the digital literacies construct. Um, I know that our audience gained a lot of valuable insight as to how and why to incorporate digital literacy skills and some really practical ideas for activities as well. We saw so many comments. This is an awesome session from Saba. Saim says, very innovative and useful. Let's see, these types of skill development activities give students a sense of belonging and help the teacher learn about them. So awesome comments. Um, thanks, everybody. So uh, 